I was visiting with Ian Heinish yesterday, and Ian and I are forming quite a friendship. We're, we're, we're talking every week, and the topic came up yesterday. It had to do with Aljo and Jan. So just to remind you guys, okay, revisionist history, but just in case you happen to be a new fan, they go fight for the world championship, which happened to be Jan's. Jan cheats. He knees Sterling when he's down. When I say the word cheat, it, that implies a lot. And I'm not looking to put Jan down. Cheating implies when we speak of it in intent. We all want to be judged on our intent, never on our actions. But we always judge others by their actions as opposed to their intent. So that's a really mean word that I throw out. But it wasn't Chael's word. It was the referee's. If the referee deems that it was intentional, he will then deem that it was illegal. If he makes that assertion, he can then disqualify you for the action. So it's very relevant, as mean as the word may be by me, that Jan was called for cheating. The same exact action, if the referee deemed unintentional, the referee did not have to do anything for. The referee had an option to give a warning. The, the referee had a little bit of latitude to just separate things and reconvene as though it never happened again. Now, don't you do that again. In, in an average MMA fight, I don't know what the, what the statistic is, but I will bet you that there is one foul per fight. That might strike you as a little bit high. But if you know how many times in a, a guy grabs a guy's uniform, which is against the rules, the guy grabs the cage, which happens all the time. Referees catch it all the time and do absolutely nothing about it. It's one of those things within our sport that people have just decided, right? They're going to legislate from the bench. The legislative of bodies in this sport have said that grabbing the cage is against the rules, but we will have a referee in the place of judgment to trump those rules on the spot. We see it all the time. It's just very common. Lots of things like this happen. Somebody's finger goes into somebody's eye. Well, it was unintentional and sure they should have had their hands closed. It's just one of these things that if you broke it down real carefully, you were going to see a lot of violations in every single fight. Not all of them get called. The referee in the fight very important how the fight's going. Everything gets judged as a body as opposed to how it's supposed to be judged, which is within the exact moment. Sterling whips Yawn. Yawn starts to turn the tide, and he starts putting a whipping on Sterling. Now, at this point, Sterling is down. Yawn stands up, grabs Aljo's head, knees him right in the face. Referee steps in. What's he going to do? If the referee does what's right, which is to call that a violation which takes one point away, the ball now goes into Sterling's camp of can you continue? If you cannot continue and a fight is stopped on an illegal technique, a disqualification will take place. This is not the WWE where the only way to win is by submission or pinfall. You guys ever see that back, back in the olden day? There's something in wrestling known as a count out or even a disqualification. But if you're in a championship match, if you do not have a submission or a pinfall, even if you win, the belt cannot change hand. It just gets really weird. It's like no part of that is true within our sport. There's actually four ways to win within our sport. You can get a decision, which is what every fighter plans for, to make sure that he's in shape. That would be a fighter's worst case scenario, meaning he's got to work the absolute longest for his money. You could get what's known as a submission. You could knock the opponent out. Or number four that nobody ever wants to talk about for some reason, which is called a disqualification. Those are your four ways to win a fight. And none has a greater value. That is just a phenomenon created by a narrative of the media. Why well, want to go and knock the guy out? What? Did somebody tell you that was better than putting him in an arm bar? Did somebody tell you that an arm bar pays more than going to a referee's decision? Like, what part of it is going to affect your ranking? What part of it is going to affect your applause? What part? It's just one of those things, right? And there is a difference. We all know that there's a difference. But to be fairness, you've got a fourth way to win, which is disqualification. So once Jan hits Aljo, the referee in that moment didn't know what to do. And he knew it was illegal, and he knew that he had to call it. He just knew if he called it because the championship was up, the championship was going to change hands. And I don't believe there's a time in this sport where that has happened before. So the referee goes and he seeks help. Instead of making the call in the moment, he goes over and he seeks help and he talks to the commission. He might have talked to another referee. I have to go back to see what all the conversations was about. But in hindsight, he's leaving Sterling, who needs medical attention, 
who we have all believe has been concussed and needs to get to the back. He's leaving him out there, and then he's going to turn the question over to him. I mean, in all fairness, the referee did nothing wrong. I'm not questioning him. I just question that rule. Why would it ever be put to the fighter? Why would the fighter ever have a say in whether he should be able to go on or not? That same exact scenario happened to Anthony Smith against John Jones, and Anthony Smith was a word away from being a millionaire, which is what would have been a rematch. He was a word away from victory. He was a word away from being a world champion. To this day, Anthony Smith does not regret it. I begrudge the fact that Anthony was even asked. If you have been so egregiously fouled to the point that we only got a couple of rules, don't bite the guy and don't kick the son bitch when he's down. Now you're talking about it going to the head where you've got concussion and all sorts of other things at play. And we're going to go get that guy's opinion. Why, why, why would I want his opinion? I have a license from the same agency and my heartbeat isn't up. I have the same exact agency licensed me to be in here and I'm not bleeding. I'm not three and four rounds in. I don't have a high stress. My livelihood is not affected. It would seem that I'm the one with the clear decision and I wouldn't need to ask some lowly cage fighter half awake what he thinks, right? I never, when I was growing up, my parents, you might've had parents like this. Certainly you've seen it somewhere in your life where the kid will do something wrong. And then the teacher, the teacher wants to ask him, now, what do you think that we should do? My dad never asked me what he thought we should do. My father had it figured out. My dad already knew how this one was going to end. But now you have referees that are in there trying to consult an athlete. I begrudge that. I don't think that it's right. That was a very clear call. That was illegal. It's a disqualification. Whatever ramifications happen after that, in that case, a switching of the belt, nothing to do with one another. But people continue to relive this. And Ian Heinish and I were speaking about that. The question was posed to us. Should Jan have been disqualified or was Sterling playing it up? You guys have heard that. You guys for sure have heard that exact topic. You've probably had conversations. You've probably waited on your opinion. Let me make this perfectly clear for you guys. Those two terms are not mutually exclusive. They both can be true. It was illegal by Jan, and Sterling played it up. What's wrong with that? What would possibly be wrong in that? I mean, how do you judge a guy? How do you judge a guy that's half naked on television? He's been fouled. He does not want to continue. And just because the fight was starting to go against him, come on, that break that he got, he was fully charged up. That has nothing to do with anything. All the same, nobody wants the fight to continue. Peter Yawn doesn't want the fight to continue. He threw the knee, hoping to hurt Sterling, hoping to end the fight. Both of them want to get out of there. Every fighter wants to be done, right? You guys can relate. Whatever you do for a living, whatever you did today, you showed up and hopefully you did a really good job today, but that's your second biggest concern. Your number one concern every single day, even in front of doing a great job, your number one concern is that you have a job to come to tomorrow. That's the number one most important thing in any job, and this sport is no different. Every time that you make that walk, your music hits those speakers and you put that mouthpiece in, the number one thing that you want is that you have a fight to come back to down the road, and you want that over and over and over again, and eventually one day you're not done with the sport. You find out the sport's done with you, and that's what we call a career. That's just the way that it goes. So I just want to clear that up because Ian Einish and I had, had a very good conversation. We had about a thousand people listening in who all unanimously agreed with us. They just never looked at it from that perspective. Yes, Aljo played it up. Aljo was telling a story. The story is, I'm hurt. Later on, he found a doctor who considered that he was concussed. So the story that he was attempting to tell, he did a very good job of. And Peter Yon also going to do that knee. I don't like the fact that we're calling him cheating. He did not calculate everything. Okay, what, what points are down? You got one, two, I'm grabbing the knee. No, he just did the technique. Here's a head, here's my knee, pull them together. I understand the whole thing, but the conclusion still had to be the same, which is a disqualification. You cannot start overlooking rules in this sport, not in this one. I don't see sports going in the NBA. You're not allowed to grab a guy's jersey. I don't ever see a referee catch somebody holding a jersey and not call it. Every single sport, it doesn't matter if you've got a thousand rules or you've got three. Don't bite the guy. Don't poke his eyes. Don't kick the son bitch when he's down. I mean, we don't have very many rules. And when I do see in our sport, some of the little ones, oh, well, that's not a big one. Not a big one according to who? The ABC will decide at their annual meetings what rules matter. Your job is to enforce them. I think that's a far bigger topic. Far bigger topic and a far bigger problem.
And I am not, once I make it, I'm not saying the referee did it right. The referee did it right. It shouldn't have been that way. It should not be a fighter gets fouled, and then you go out and you ask him, guys, first ever UFC summit they ever held, 2008. If I'm wrong, it was 2009. All sorts of classes. Dana flies everybody in from all over. It takes a whole day of travel. We got guys coming in from Germany. We got them coming in from Cuba. We got them coming in from Russia. I only had to go about two hours from Portland, but you get the point. You have a whole day of travel. You will then start classes, and it's just like you're back in college. From 9 to 10 a.m., you're here. From 10 a.m., you're going to take lunch from noon to 1. Different speakers would come and talk to us about everything. Performance-enhancing drugs, talk to you about nutrition, talked about taxes, talked about promotion. It was a whole thing. We had an entire tech department set up in the back to set every fighter before this thing up with something known as Twitter and something that could get you a blue check mark. We didn't even know what that was. Sharing with you what went on at this event, but of this event that was three days, Dana only walked in the room personally and spoke one time. And I remember it perfectly clear because I knew when he came in and he went to all this expense to put this on, whatever he's about to say is one thing that freaking matters. At this period of time of 2009-ish, there was a big thing going around our sport that if a fighter was ever fouled and the fighter was asked, can you continue? that the fighter had to say yes, that that was not truly an option, that that was a formality. This was a narrative, and this was going around everywhere. And people in the media were even supported. Of course, they have to go on, or the UFC will punish them. It will show a lack of heart. It will show a lack of grit. That was a real belief. And Dana came in the room to clear that up, and he said, that is not true. I do not ever expect you to go on when you've been fouled. And then he qualified his statement with a statistic. He said, as a matter of fact, we have only had one athlete ever be fouled and go on to win the fight. Every other athlete who has ever worked at the deficit of putting up with an illegal move of his opponent has lost. I do not ever expect you to answer that question by the referee any other way than the truth. Tell him if you can go on or if you can't. I remember I remember because of the qualification that Dana put on, and I only bring that to you as I, I do think people have given Aljo a very hard time. I think that Aljo did everything right. Aljo's got one goal when he gets in there, which is to follow the absolute number one rule, which is protect yourself at all times. You then have other goals of hoping to get victory. You have other goals of byproducts to hoping to get a championship or to come back or to return to a main event or to impress the crowd. or get. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you think that you've watched that tape and you've determined that Aljo was playing it up, and that's a very loose term that nobody fully knows what it means, good. We concede. You don't ever get to the point in the tape where you get to judge if Aljo played it up until you've seen that it, an illegal move was done to him. So just stop the tape right there. Was Aljo down? Was he fouled? If the answer is yes, you don't ever get to see the rest of the tape. Where how does he react to it? And how does he play to the media within that moment? Stop the tape. 